Mark chapter number 4. I'm going to read one verse. Verse number 9. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in context, Jesus just finished the parable of the sower. Uh, you can find reference that over in Matthew. Or you can find it in Luke. This is another account of the same story. Verse number 1. He's teaching by the seaside. Okay, it says there was a great multitude. So he entered into a ship, sat in the sea, and a whole multitude was by the sea on the land. I mean, it brings to mind the other passage from the gospel where he saw the great multitude saying that they didn't have a shepherd or a teacher, and he took compassion on them. So he entered into a ship, cast off a little bit, and he taught them out of the ship, the great multitude. I mean, every time you find that people wanted to hear something from God, Jesus would take the time to give them what God would have to hear. And oftentimes, when he would teach, he would use parables. I mean, verse number 10, when he was alone, they that were uh, about him with the twelve asked of, asked of him the parable. Made in the Lord, what's it mean? Right, he would use a parable, an earthly story with a hidden heavenly meaning. Okay, nowadays people like to use metaphor a lot. Right, he's using something that they can understand to reveal to them a hidden truth that they really desired. Okay, they understood about farming, so what did he use? He used the parable of the sower and the seed. Right, they understood how hard it was to plant something in the middle of weeds. He understood how hard it was for you know to plant something in the ground that had nothing but rocks in it. And then they also understood that if that seed landed by the wayside on not good dirt, where it wasn't going to be tended, what would happen? The fowls would come in and sweep it away. They understood that analogy because that's what they did. If they weren't a farmer, they knew a farmer. right? And in the villages that they lived in, if they didn't farm, the farmer might have lived right next door, or they would trade with the farmer, with their goods in order to get some of his goods they understood toiling in the field so Jesus never spoke over anybody's head he came down to us literally left heaven to come to us why would he speak above our head he spoke to them in a way that they could understand but still to this day how is the word discerned spiritually the Holy Ghost takes the word of God and however it is that you need to understand it, that's how he explains it to you. Right? That's the beauty of preaching or teaching out of the Bible. We don't do it under the power of man. No, we do it through the power and the unction of the Holy Ghost, which is why one man can get up, preach or teach one message or one lesson, and everybody in the audience will get something different out of it. That's not because that person was a great speaker. That's because God knows what you need. And each person will understand it the way that they best need to understand it. And that's really what today's lesson's about. is the true, eternal state of the Bible. Right? It is forever settled in heaven. But more importantly than that, it is always alive. Just because you heard it once doesn't mean you're going to hear the same thing even though you're reading the same verse. And bear with me a little bit. But using verse number 9, we're going to show you, and I'm sure that there's a whole lot more, but just thinking about it this week, Lord, there's four different ways you can read verse number 9. All of them are true. All of them are still as relevant. Right? We're not taking nothing out of context. What are we doing? We're showing you that the Bible can be used, same verse, talking to the same people. But yet, depending on where you are in your spirituality, the Bible is always alive. There's always something for you to go back and draw from the well again, get a new drink. You're never going to find that the well is empty. Okay, so verse number 9. Keep in mind, he just finished the parable of the sower okay he's done talking to the crowd he's done teaching them 
And he says, verse number 9, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, he was already done talking. So the first literal translation in context, what he's talking to him is, you've just heard, so anybody that has ears to hear, go and tell them. He just finished the lesson to them, the parable of the sower. And he says, now go and tell those that have ears to hear. Keep in mind, after he says this, he's done teaching. The crowd goes away. Then those that are with him say, Lord, explain to us the parable. The multitude wasn't there that, 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 when the explanation happens. He tells the multitude, it's the last thing he tells them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What's he saying? You've heard, so go and tell. Literally what he's telling them is, you've just heard the story of how the seed being the word of God and the gospel is only good if it's spread. He says it has to be spread on good ground. Notice he doesn't say, go and tell the stubborn, the belligerent, right? those that will resist against you. He's saying, he that hath ears to hear, go and tell them. Doesn't matter if you think they're going to receive it. Doesn't matter what kind of ground you think it is. If they've got ears, go and tell them. Is that not the Great Commission? Go into all the world? That's what he's telling them. You've heard the gospel of what the Word of God really is. He's not telling them to go out and repeat the parable. He's saying, take your seed and go and cast it. I mean, Wednesday night, the missionary, Brother Bach, even said, you know, when he was teaching on that parable, he said there were tares that were sown among the wheat. Well, what did the master of the field say? He said, let them both grow up together and we'll deal with it at harvest time. He's saying, don't worry about what the devil's doing. Don't worry about what's going on that you can't control. Instead, just go out and cast your seed. If they've got ears, go and tell them. Because why did God give you ears so that you could hear? Why did God choose people to win other people? Because that's the way that God intended it. These ears, you can hear it, but in order for you to believe it, you've got to use that thing called faith. That's what the seed taking root really is. By faith you received it. And then God can do something with it. Remember, that's a literal, he's saying, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Go and tell them. They got ears, go spread what you've heard of me. And what did he teach of? He didn't teach of himself, he taught of the Father and the Father's will. How everything that he did was so that God could accomplish his goal, which was what? To redeem fallen man. He says, go and tell them. But the second one, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying, those that are looking for an answer, perk your ears up. Keep in mind, these were people that were truly under the bondage of religion. They had a claim to God, but they didn't know God personally in a relationship. Most of them just did what the Pharisees told them to do, which if you go and study that, the Pharisees were a bunch of legalists. If you can keep this, if you can do this, then you're holy with God. Well, no, I find that because of the list called the law, I know that there's no way I can be holy with God. The Pharisees believed that they could merit the favor of God because they were Abraham's descendants. But Jesus taught them, because you are Abraham's descendants, God made a way for you to be redeemed because you couldn't be redeemed on your own. He said, God chose Abraham to send his seed. He made a promise with Abraham that he was God's chosen people. Then through David, he promised that he would send the Christ through his lineage. And that through Christ... Israel would be turned back into what God always what's that? That's that millennial reign. 
Okay, but because some thought even the Apostle Paul dealt with it. Said that because ye are Abraham's seed, you think you're okay. What they didn't understand is that when Jesus went and led captivity captive after he got you know, crucified and then he collected his blood, went down to the inner place of the earth, wherever Abraham's bosom was. We know that you could see hell from there. There was a great gulf between them where you could see across. Go see the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Right, he cried unto Father Abraham. But when Jesus went down there, guess what? Abraham had to get saved by the same blood that you and I had to get saved by. They were trusting in their lineage rather than the one that marked their lineage to be special. That was God. Right, what did Abraham do for all of his life? Go read the book of Hebrews. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He wasn't satisfied with what he had because he knew what he had wasn't enough. He wanted God. So, Jesus is saying, those that realize that they need something different than just religion, those like that Ethiopian eunuch that Philip ran across, what keeps me from being baptized? Well, you got to get saved first because baptism is just obedience. Baptism doesn't save you. Right? The Ethiopian knew that he needed to be baptized. He just didn't know what he needed on top of that. Before that. They needed the Savior to move in. Right? Those that came to Jesus by night, Nicodemus. What must I do to be born again? Nicodemus knew that everything that he had done, even though in the eyes of the world he may have been a righteous man, he was certainly a religious man, I believe he was an earnest man. You don't find many Pharisees coming to Jesus by night saying, truly, what do we need to attain eternal life. Most of them were worried about the carnal life, not the eternal life. But yet Nicodemus comes and says, Lord, what must I do? And then, I don't believe that he said it rebukingly, but he's just saying, Lord, help me understand. How can I enter into my mother's womb a second time? What does it mean to be born again? And Jesus says, no, no, no. You're talking about birth of the water. I'm talking about birth of the Spirit. If he'd have mocked Jesus... If he'd have been ridiculing them, Jesus wouldn't have answered. He'd have done what he did with all the Pharisees. Was that to rebuke them? Usually he made them matter in a wet hand. Right? And then he'd go on his way. But yet he said, those that know that they need an answer, the answer is here. Let them hear. He said, everybody that realizes you missing something, he says, I'm the one that you've been waiting for. He that hath ears to hear, some people don't have ears to hear. They're stopped up. They're turned away. Some of them, it's just empty between them. It goes in one ear and then out the other. Right? They may listen, but they don't hear. He's saying those that have ears to hear, they have itching ears. They know that they need to hear something. He's saying, let them hear about me. He's not just saying, go and tell everybody. He's saying, those that need an answer, the answer's right here. You want to know what you need? You need the Word of God to take root in your life like a seed. You need to accept it into your heart. You need to allow the Holy Ghost to take out all them weeds and all them rocks out of your heart. Right? Make you into that new creature so that that root can really get grounded, bloom, and you can become fruitful for God. Because the rocks aren't going to allow you to have roots. The weeds are going to choke you out. And if you just let it go by the wayside, it's not going to do anything for you. He said, if you know you need something, here's what you need, the Word of God. Let it take root. But then third, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a commandment. But right? we are saved by the hearing of the Word of God. Right? And God chose through the foolishness of preaching. Right? How shall they hear without a preacher? Right? Hearing or receiving is really what saved you. 
It was by grace that God allowed you to hear, and after you heard, it was through faith that you believed what you had heard. That is not a real complicated math problem. Why did you get saved? Because you heard it, and then you believed it. But why did you hear it? Because through God's you know, omnipotence, His omniscience, His omnipresence, His grace and His mercy, He made a way that somebody told you what you needed to hear. He said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's a commandment for the whole world to listen, to seek out, and to desire news of the Savior. But then again, that goes back to our first point. The world's in darkness. How shall they hear if somebody doesn't go? But this is also a promise. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying everybody needs the Savior, but he's saying listen or let them hear. Meaning, if they listen to what I've got to say for them, it'll help them. It's what they need. I can get up and I can wax poetic all day long on Star Wars. I'm wearing my Darth Vader tie today. But truly, if you listen to that, that's not going to help you none. May entertain Brother Tommy, but that's about it. Okay, maybe Brandon too. But, but what are you saying? There's a lot of things that people say not going to help you. I mean, the world ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. We can get Brother Mike up here and he can t talk to you about all the remodeling of bathrooms that he wants to, but eternally that's not going to make a difference for you. If you want to redo your own bathroom, that would help you, but I'll save you a whole lot of time and knee pain. Just hire him. Right? There's many things that the world's figured out how to do and you can hear all day long, but it's not going to help. Jesus is saying, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear this, because this is truth. It's a call. He's saying, if you've got ears and you want to hear something, hear this. The promise, of it, I mean, keep in mind, he wasn't just talking to them people in that crowd that day. He knew that Matthew and Mark would record down the parable of the sower. He knew that they would, they both include this line, quoting Jesus. He knew that the word of God, being forever settled, would one day make its way to you. This wasn't a promise to those in the crowd that day only. This was a promise for all men of all eternity for the rest of the time until Jesus comes back. Today, the same is still true. He's saying, if you've got ears to hear, in other words, you're willing to listen, hear this. Do you know what will help somebody today just as much as it helped them back then? Jesus. His words change, I mean, his ways change not. His words change not because they're forever settled. He fulfilled every jot and tittle because that's how serious he is about his word. And there's a half that's never been told. What's he saying? This is timeless. Doesn't matter if it's in the year roughly 31 AD according to the cheat sheet in the, you know, the middle section of my Bible up here. Is that really when this happened? I don't know. It was around that time. But you know what? It was just as true then and it's still true today. Brother Clint's favorite line when he goes out on visitation. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. There's nothing new under the sun. You know what God's expectations when Jesus was on the earth was? Christ. You know what his expectation is today? Christ. You know what people need to hear? That God's ways change. He still expects the same thing. And the expectation is not that we can become like Christ on our own. No, he said he would make us into a new creature. The beauty of verse number 9 is that was he literally talking to a great multitude that day? Yes. But he was also talking to you. Keep in mind, this is the thrice holy God. The one that's omnipresent. That doesn't just mean every place at once. That means everywhere in time at once. 
He is all places at all times. You say, explain that. I'm taking that one on faith. I can't wrap my head around that one. But you know what that means? You know, we love that song. While he was on the cross, I was on his mind. When he was teaching this lesson, you were on his mind. He knew that you needed it just as much as those people in the crowd needed it that day. And he didn't promise that through the passing down of tales like man does, right? we can go back to however far back you want to go, there are old wives' tales and legends in every culture that were handed down through the oral tradition. Right? He didn't say, I'm not leaving it up on man's ability to remember. You want to find out that man's memory is flawed, go look at, or flawed, go look at Adam and Eve. They were perfect, sinless. And yet they... Eve added to right Adam neglected he was supposed to keep the garden he didn't keep the garden or else the serpent wouldn't have been in there Eve misremembered and added to what God had actually said now granted Eve wasn't around when that commandment was given which means either Adam told it to her wrong or when Adam told it to Eve he added to it or she did both of them what are you saying? Man's memory is not much to hang its hat on. Especially after sin entered into the world. Right, my watches, I like watches that not only tell me what day of the month it is, but day of the week, because sometimes I forget. You think I'm kidding, I'm not. Some days just feel like Thursdays, and I convince myself that they're Thursdays, and oh no, it's Tuesday. I've still got three more of these things left before the weekend. what are we saying man's memory wasn't anything to hang your hat on but Jesus said I know that the word will be preserved I know that one day they're going to hold a bible in their hands and they're going to read this verse this lesson was just as much for them as it was for anybody else in the crowd that day he was saying perk up your ears pay attention if you've got ears to hear hear if you know somebody that has ears to hear, go and tell them. But he's also promising anybody from now until when I come back again that has ears to hear, they can hear the same thing and it'll give them the same help. But then, fourth, we get back down here. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That was a accepting statement. He didn't say those of the Jewish belief tradition, the lineage of Abraham, if they have ears to hear. No, it says, let him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Who is that him? That's anybody. That's a whosoever him. That's not talking about just this clan, just this tribe, just this sect. Anybody wants to hear, let them hear. I mean, it, it marveled the Pharisees that Jesus was the friend of publicans and sinners. How much more do you think it marveled the Pharisees when a centurion comes unto them and says, Lord, only you can do what I need done. That, or when Darius comes down to him, or Jarius, however you want to say it, comes to him, right? A public figure, a political individual, someone who's by trade, by his own word, and by his own actions believed that Caesar was the one that had everything that he needed. Yet he comes and falls down at the feet of Jesus. Right? You think that that made the Pharisees angry? They were angry when he was the friend of Jewish publicans and sinners. Imagine how it was when he started helping out Gentiles. Right? What do you think they did when they heard about the woman at the well? They were upset that he was going out and casting out demons out of people that lived in graveyards and gnashed on themselves and broke chains when people tried to chain him up to keep him from hurting himself. Imagine what he did when he said... Y'all didn't want to receive it. So I'll give it to those that do want to hear. 
Because long before anybody ever came to Jesus, they'd heard about Jesus. Why did they come? Because they'd heard. And when they heard, what'd they do? They believed what they'd heard. In fact, some believed so much that many times Jesus said he did not find faith like that in all of Israel. The people that should have had cause to have enough faith in God should have had the most faith in what God had said. The ones that had had the very prophecies and promises handed down to them to let them know Christ had come, they didn't believe. In fact, because of their religion, most of them have been made twofold the child of hell. They weren't willing to unbelieve what they had been taught in order to believe the truth. So, what's his promise? He that hath ears. That's anybody. That's an open doctrine. Now, that's not predestined. He, he that hath ears and is of the elect of God. No, that's not predestination. It's not Calvinism. That's everybody. If they have ears to hear, tell them even if they end up not believing. There's no condition that will only tell those that you're pretty sure are going to believe what you tell them. No, he says anybody that wants to hear, God will tell them. You see, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God looks through time and sees that because of that seed, some may have thought it fell by the wayside, but God can use it. Some plant, some water. And throughout, however long in their life, God just sends people by with a water pail, keep watering, reminding them of that seed that they had heard at one point. And then, who knows, one day, takes root, person gets saved. They finally believe what they had heard. You do realize what that passage is about, some plant, some water, God gives the increase. You know what that means? That we're not concerned with the fruit. That's the master of the vineyard's job. What are we? We're his loving servants. He says, go over there and do a funky dance on that plot of ground. But Lord, what in the world is that going to do? No, you're going to do it. One, because we love him. And two, he knows what he's doing. Say, Lord, I've been watering this spot of ground for 20 years. He says, just keep watering. Lord, I want to go water that one over there. That's the fruit that I really want to see. That's the pineapple and I like pineapple. I don't want to keep watering this radish. Right? He says, just keep watering this. I've got people to take care of that. You may have planted that, but there's other people to water. You water this. What's the command? He says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. I mean, he cared so much that when the disciples tried to shoo away the little children, he said, suffer not the little children. He said, you offend one of them, be better for you to go and be chucked out into the ocean with a giant weight around your neck. It'd be better for you to drown a painful death than to grieve a child that by faith wants to come to God. That's how serious Jesus was, that he included them little children, included the elderly, included the esteemed, included the dregs of this world and the gutters. However we would view them, God views them all the same. Somebody that needs to hear. If they ask, tell them. If the Holy Ghost opens the door, tell them. He that has ears to hear. Now, with the planting and the watering, that's God's business. But you know what's our business? Obedience. But great commission in this verse still just as true. Go tell everybody what you heard. Right? It's still a promise to you today. Whatever you need to hear, he's got the answer. 
Right? But what's the condition? He that has ears to hear. Not ears to block out, not ears to just come and then be concerned with all the cares of everything going on outside of the world. Not ears that when you get down into your prayer closet, instead of inwardly trying to get, that's what true prayer is, is getting your will and God's will lined up together. Right? Conforming your will into what God's will would be. But instead of that, we're thinking about all the things we'd like to see done. About all the things we would like to happen. But most, I'm not saying they're wicked things. Just saying if they're not in line with God's will, you don't need it. But instead of letting go of them things, we dwell on them. Instead of saying, Lord, I'm just going to put this in your hands and whatever you want to happen, that's what I want to happen. Instead of doing that, we say, yeah, but Lord, I'd really like for this to happen. Yeah, and I'd like to make enough money to where I can give to where all the missionaries up there would never want for a thing. Right? But if that were the case, that wouldn't be of faith. Right? How do we give to mission? Faith. I believe that this is what God wants me to give, and that's what I'm going to give to the church. And then we believe that God, through the church, will give what the church needs to give. And we also believe that because God doesn't want to rob a blessing from people, other churches will support, give them what they need. And that collectively, God's got enough cattle on enough hills, because he owns all of them, that he can take care of them just like he takes care of us. Now, would I like to be able to do that? Yes, absolutely. Do I need to be able to do that? No, God's got it all in control. Right, well, go another avenue. Right, he that hath ears to hear, us personally. Right, ears to hear are attentive ears. Right, they pay attention. They're receptive ears. You're not just listening, but you're allowing the Holy Ghost to process it into what you need. Right, you're asking God, all right, Lord, I know that this verse is as true today as it was yesterday. Right? I'm clinging on to that verse, but Lord, i got another promise that I need for, for today. Or Lord, I've got another question today. Still believe what you told me yesterday, but today's the day that the Lord hath made, which means there's something He wants me to do. But Lord, I need something to get me through today. You gave me what I needed yesterday. I believe you'd give me what I need today. Well, you may be attentively reading the Word of God, but unless you're allowing the Holy Ghost to take the Word and teach it to you, discern it to you, right? it's going to be a done effect. You can memorize a chapter a day. It doesn't make you any more spiritual. You may be more knowledgeable. You've heard it. You've received it. You've memorized it. But you missed the blessing that God wanted to give you out of it. What's it? That's the difference between hearing and receiving. Being attentive. I believe there's a whole bunch of people in the crowd that day heard the parable and never got the underlying meaning. Why you say that, Brother Jordan? Because those that were closest to him said, Lord, what's that parable mean? They weren't paying attention. They's listening. But they weren't allowing God to speak to them while they were listening. That, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. You put on the radio in the car, you tune out the music, which is what you should be listening to, or the talk radio, and all you do is get angry when the commercials come on. Right? Well, I was listening to that. Well, what did he just say? That's just background noise. You claim you're listening, but while you're listening, you're thinking about everything else in the world, it doesn't make an impact. Right? Most of y'all don't watch TV to be entertained. Most of y'all watch TV so that there's something going on in the background while you're working whatever's on your iPad in front of you. Right? It's just background noise. You hear it, but it doesn't make any impact on you. Right? And I know none of us have halos. We've all come and during the singing, during the preaching, during testifying, 
somewhere along the way this flesh gets a little unruly and all of a sudden you're off in a far country thinking about something and then it hits you all of a sudden what in the world am I doing that Holy Ghost will prick your heart and say hey back to this what are you saying brother there's a difference between having ears and having ears to hear he commands us he's saying everything you need to hear is right here all the truth you ever need all the revelation you ever need all the prophecy you ever need all the promises you need all the standards that you need to keep in your life they're all right here all the personal convictions in your life are in this Bible they may be different personal convictions from somebody else in this room but you know where they got theirs from if they came from God right here but you know how you find those things you gotta have ears to hear but then also he says he says ears to hear let them hear you may want to know the answer you may know where you can get the answer you may be willing to go to wherever you need to go to hear the answer but unless you actually end up hearing it doesn't do you any good we think of the blind man who heard Jesus coming by started crying everybody told him shut up he just started shouting even louder Jesus said son of David have mercy upon me right he had heard but then he finds out that the one that he had heard about that he believes can help him is right over there he knows he cannot go to him he's a blind man everybody else is telling him to shut up they're certainly not going to help him get to where Jesus is right they're being selfish hey we can't hear him shut up and he says yeah but I need to get to him so I'm not going to shut up I'm going to get even louder that he's saying I can't do what that man can do for me but I believe he can right the latter part of this verse and let him hear let him hear that's the act of us exercising faith to get to where we need to be that blind man knew I can't get to where I need to be Jesus has to come to me well guess what when you was lost you couldn't get to where Jesus was but Jesus could get to you right there the Holy Spirit he, he convicted you by faith you believed that if you asked him to save you he'd come to where you were and save you guess what if you believed it and you asked him he did because it's impossible for him to lie and he promised that he would right? but after we get saved according to the book of Revelation he made you a priest you can enter directly into the throne room of God so long as there's no iniquity or unconfessed sin in your life your prayers go directly to God that's a great responsibility because I know where I can hear the answer but I've got to be willing to go not in person spiritually Lord we're going to put life on the shelf for a little bit Lord if I go a little bit hungry that's okay we didn't plan on fasting today but I'm just dedicating this time to you Lord I know where my answers come from. I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day I'm not just persuaded that he can keep my soul until he comes back I'm persuaded he's got all the answers that I need while I'm still here you know what the implication with that is I have to be willing to go and hear you know why these people in this multitude heard that day because they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say and they came to him he didn't stop by their house and say hey heard you were looking for me no he was about the father's business and in fact you know many occasions the multitude would come out to meet him he wouldn't be headed into town but town would come to him right one time he gets in the boat 
But the disciples, he says, hey, we're going to go into a desert place rest for a while. They get off the boat, and somehow the multitude, even though they sailed straight in a line, they went all the way around the sea and met them on the other side. Can't tell me they weren't serious about hearing what God wanted for them. What did he do? They came to hear. He said. See, just because God's given you all the ability to go where you need to be, have spiritually, right, the tools through the person of the Holy Spirit, to have the Word of God enlightened unto you. It can be a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. Holy Ghost to lead and guide you in all truth. Just because you've got a pastor that God's charged with watching over your soul and charged them with delivering messages every time that the doors are open that are heaven breathed and inspired because they're what you need today. Right? They're what you need in order to either get back in line with what God wants you to do, to take an extra step of faith to be where God wants you to be, to get outside of your comfort zone. Right? Just because He's given you a pastor and all the tools that you need doesn't mean that you have to use them. We can go through the Bible and see all the benefits. I mean, we can look at the whole armor of God and how God designed every facet of that armor to protect you from everything in the world so that you can be more than a conqueror through Christ. So that you can have faith when he says, stand right there, I can stand right here and not be moved. Like a tree planted by the water. Can't move me because my roots are deeper in this world. They're in the one that breathed this world into existence. If he says, stand, I believe I can stand. But how long are you going to stand as long as he needs me to? Well, how can he say that? Because he promised not to put more on me than I can bear. He promised that I can't be tempted above what I'm able to bear. He promised that if I cast all my cares upon him, that he'd take them because he cares for me. He also promised that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You know what that means? He's given me enough to stand as long as he wants me to. But that doesn't help you if you don't hear about how the armor can be a benefit to you. If you don't go to the Lord and ask Him, well, Lord, help me equip the armor to where it don't fall off. Now, you guys ever see kids? They may not make these anymore. But I remember back in the day we had a toy box. And there were things that I used to use when it was just me and Dad, and I got to do whatever I wanted to. And then Yahoo and Yahoo S came along, and they started ruining stuff. Right? But I remember I had that, uh, what was his name? John Smith from Pocahontas had that, like, breastplate, had all the straps on it and everything. Right? Had the Peter Pan gear, right? All the costumes. But yet, Yahoo and Yahoo S were too excited about putting it on that they never put it on right. And you'd see them, like, running around with a breast, you know, this chest piece that's, like, flopping over and falling off of them because they only put one of the straps on. And they're just running around with something. I'm like, you're doing it wrong, right? This isn't fun anymore because you're ruining things. I'm going to go play PlayStation. Right? But in all seriousness, we just can't go around assuming that because we threw it on, it's going to help us. It's got to be put on right. It's got to be donned, not just put on got to be received and treated with the seriousness that God intended it to be in our lives. That breastplate's supposed to protect your heart. Right? Protect through the word of God when it says that in their bowels it's talking about literally the, their stomach, the emotions that they, you, you guys ever get so worried that it feels like you're having an ulcer? Right? That's what the Bible says that when somebody talks about it, you know, they feel it in their back. That's what it's talking about. That breastplate of righteousness, it's supposed to protect you from worrying. Right? It's supposed to protect you from heartbreak. It's supposed to protect you from all the emotions that this world's going to throw at you. Guilt. Right? The feeling that you're not enough. Inadequacy. Stress. Right? The pressure or the burden of trying to keep up with everybody else. 
God doesn't want you to be everybody else. God wants you to be you. You know what we find? Out? Because in the breastplate of righteousness, I'm robed in His righteousness. When He sees me, He sees me as I will be. And you know what He says? Still love Him. He's not looking for me to be anybody else. He wants me to be me through Christ. If that wasn't enough, He wouldn't have saved me. Well, saying, there's a lot of comfort in that breastplate of righteousness. That helmet of salvation doesn't matter what the world throws thoughts into your mind or anything else or what it is the new fad the new movement the new self help book you know what protects your thoughts now I've got what I need it's Jesus my salvation wasn't contingent upon me saying alright Lord thank you for saving me now but what are the next 12 requirements that I need to take in order to stay saved no I'm just as saved today as it was the day I got saved no contingencies, nothing added to it. Just what God said. But we say, there's a difference between knowing where you can get help and humbling yourself and saying, Lord, I'm just going to stay here until I get what I need. If we need to go back over them lessons that I forgot, those things that I've put out of my mind because I've been running every which way but loose, Lord, those things that in the flesh... I'm apt to forget. If you need to remind me, Lord, I'm here until I get the answer. He's saying, if you've got ears to hear, you know where to come for the answer. But he didn't say it was enough to have ears to hear. He said, you had to hear. Let him hear. What's that mean? Come to where the answer is and receive it. You can't receive something if you're not there to get it can't receive something if you know where you need to go but you decide to go but never walk up and accept what has been offered saying let him hear he's promising you that everything you need he has but what's the contingency I've got to be humble enough to go and say Lord I don't know Lord I'm weak and I need I'm imperfect but Lord I believe that you have what it's going to take to make me more like Christ swallowing that thing called pride and just saying Lord I am poor and needy but I know that you are great and merciful he's saying you get all that out of one verse brother Jordan yep and a whole lot more but we ran out of time did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud and Google Play Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.